Richard Vine is the managing editor at Art in America, uh, holds a PhD in literature from University of Chicago, uh, previously uh, served as editor-in-chief of the Chicago Review of Dialogue, an art journal. He's taught at the School of the Art Institute, uh, which someone here is going to that school. Not here. Um, uh, the American Conservatory of Music, University of Riyadh, the New School for Social Research, and NYU. Uh, some 300 of his articles, reviews, and interviews have appeared in various journals, including Art in America, uh, Tema Celeste, and Modern Poetry Studies. His critical books include A Career Survey, Odnerdom, <coughs> Painting, Sketches, and Drawings, and New China, New Art, which traces the emergence of avant-garde art in post-Mao China. In 19, or 2016, he published the crime novel, Soho Sins, uh, set in the New York art world of the 1990s. Please welcome Richard Vine. Thank you, Robert. Um, this is really old home week. I mean, to see <laughs> so many old friends and uh, and so many images from my lost youth. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking today about um, the problem of apprehension and um, how Asian, but today specifically Chinese art, particularly Chinese painting, uh, is viewed critically and curatorially in the West and, and what the underlying problems are in trying to translate that aesthetic. Um, I should probably give you fair warning that you should take everything I say with a grain of salt. I, I remember the very first talk that I ever gave in China was at the, the Shanghai Biennale in the year 2000, uh, and it was titled, Welcome to the Monoculture. The thesis being that globalism was a fait accompli, uh, that we were all coming together, you know, much as the states became the United States, the world was becoming this unified culture, and we were all going to be on our cell phones chatting about the latest Beyonce music video or whatever, and all would be well with the world. Um, looking around today, all I can say is, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> uh, We've seen this great resurgence of nationalism. <clears throat> um, and more specifically, within the Chinese art world, uh, we've seen a kind of mutual retraction. Um, we saw earlier today how there was this tremendous opening up in the 80s and then uh, in the 90s, and, and then the incursion of the market, and then these kind of mad glory years between 2004 and 2008 when Chinese art was the hottest thing on the, the global market. And then the world financial crisis came. Uh, and there was this kind of mutual retraction. Uh, Western curators and collectors becoming much more cautious about how they invest their money and feeling much less comfortable investing in a culture they didn't really understand. And at the same time, within China, uh, a kind of resurgent cultural identity and nationalism um, and a burgeoning market so that uh, many, many contemporary Chinese artists are able to have perfectly fine careers without worrying very much about whether they sell work in France or what have you, although they'd like to. Uh, in a sense, they don't really need it the, the way they did in the past. Um, so, as part of that effort, uh, one of the things that happened was that uh, there was a, a move within China to use contemporary art as a kind of form of soft power um, and to present Chinese aesthetics abroad. Um, the underlying notion seemed to be that uh, if Western people just saw enough uh, ink painting, <laughs> they would somehow have this conversion experience, you know, like Paul on the road to Damascus. Uh, and it never quite happened. <laughs> uh, I remember the Venice Biennale in the year 
2013, there was a huge show called uh, The Voice of the Unseen, which had about 150 Chinese artists, most of whom did tradition-based work in one way or another. And in addition, there were at least a dozen other Chinese shows. Altogether, 350 Chinese artists in Venice <clears throat> at that time. Only a small number of them part of the official biennial, many of them part of ancillary shows. Um, but it was a major cultural effort, which critically went nowhere. <laughs> um, Western critics were not converted. <laughs> um, and it's interesting to, to note that this was taking place exactly the same year that uh, Xi Jinping came to power, um, who in subsequent years has become you know, more and more clearly nationalistic in his approach. Um, and most recently in Venice in 2017, the official Chinese pavilion in the middle of this celebration of global contemporary art showed what? Anyone remember the Chinese pavilion in 2017? Ink painting, embroidery, paper cutting, and puppetry. <laughs> um, it was kind of fascinating. I, mean, I, I sort of enjoyed it. But it was the most peculiar gesture, um, you know, sociopolitically. Um, so I'm waiting to see what's going to happen this year. <laughs> uh, so all of this started me thinking about what, what is it about traditional Chinese aesthetics that makes this translation so difficult? Um, and you know, you can look at sociopolitical reasons about different ways of doing business, East and West and whatnot, but let's look at the sheer aesthetics of it. Um, so we can begin with this contrast between notions of tradition and innovation. Now here we have, you know, sort of classic Chinese landscape painting. Uh, I think this is one of the earliest surviving examples and one of the most beautiful. Um, and this is already what, you know, around 950, let us say. Uh, which means that there were hundreds of years of development prior to this, before this was even uh, able to be completed. Um, and then we come a thousand years later, and essentially this is what Chinese landscape painting looks like today. Now, people who are specialists in this field will be very quick to point out, but oh, you know, there were all of these subtle, formal innovations along the way. You know, this artist uh, learned how to make branches with the flick of a brush, and this artist outlined his figures where that artist didn't, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which is all true and, and all interesting um, if you're part of that culture. But if you're part of a different culture, and one that's based on constant innovation, uh, it becomes very difficult to understand why we pay attention to this now. We understand its value a thousand years ago, but why this now? Um, the answer, I suppose, would be, well, a thousand years ago we discovered these eternal verities, the truth about man's place in the cosmos and human relationship to nature, etc., and that doesn't change. The underlying story does not change. Um, but I guess the Western answer would be that everything else changes, particularly in our art, um, and particularly since the end of the, the 19th century and the beginning of the modernist revolution. Um, there have been plenty of change before this. You know, if you think of those thousand years you know, Western art was going from the Romanesque to the Gothic to the Renaissance to Baroque to <laughs> neoclassicism, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get to the end of the 19th century and the beginning of modernism, and it really speeds up. Um, and here you have a kind of consummate example, Duchamp's Fountain, um, where he has undermined 
all preceding notions of what art is and should be. Uh, at one time in Western culture, there was a notion that there were you know, noble subjects, there were noble materials, there were noble techniques. Duchamp overturns, literally, all of that by turning this urinal on its side and signing it as a work of art. Someone once argued that the, this actually looks like a seated Buddha. <laughs> I don't know if we want to make that cultural link. <laughs> Um, and sort of the uh, quintessential expression of this was given by Ezra Pound in 1934 in his book called Make It New. I mean, this is the credo of the Western avant-garde, right? Um, every artist is supposed to distinguish his work from the work of the past, from the work of his contemporaries, and even from the work that he did two years ago. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, given the uh, political orientation of most of the artists, um, it's the same principle that underlies business. I mean, make it new is exactly the same imperative that the people at Apple have. Right? Every couple of years, we've got to come up with a new product that's going to wow the world, that's going to change the way we live. Right? Um, and that's also the imperative underlying avant-garde art. And I just took this partial list at random from an internet page of some of the movements since the inception of modernism. Right? And this is only a small portion. Uh, the point being not only the great number and variety, but how fundamentally different some of them are. I mean, if you think about the difference between minimalism and Dada, you're really talking about two entirely different worldviews. Uh, so that it's not just a matter of move, you know one, one small formal innovation. Uh, it's a, it's like a, a metaphysical transformation from one to the other. So another major difference, I believe, is between emptiness and fullness. Um, again, here's a, you know, a typical uh, Chinese landscape, um, which looks perfectly fine on, on the one hand. Um, but it's interesting to note that at least half of the space here is untouched. At least half of this picture is emptiness. <laughs> and the mind fills in, right? <laughs> Which is very different from the Western approach. I mean, <laughs> in the West, we tend to have a lot of stuff, <laughs> and a lot of stuff happens. <laughs> uh, a lot of material, a lot of incident. I mean, this is a death painting. <laughs> um, and it's not just in representational art. I mean, here's you know, <laughs> an example from Pollock. Uh, where he seems to be like charting the unconscious, right? The inner turmoil of the human psyche. Another contrast um, is flatness as opposed to volume and perspective. Um, this example from the 16th century I chose because um, actually it has a little volume. I mean, the way that the the scraggly beard overlies the, the collar, um, and you get that sort of sunken effect around the eyes. Um, nevertheless, it remains primarily a sign, uh, a more or less flat representation or, uh, or signification of a person and a personality, as opposed to something like a self-portrait by Rembrandt where you have complete volume uh, and you have every wrinkle, you have every wart. And the approach is not the presentation of a sign, it's uh, the, the presentation of actual visual experience uh, and a kind of empirical approach to the world. Um, 
what does the world actually look like? Uh, and uh, sometimes with multiple figures, the same sort of thing. Here's a very beautiful pattern painting with, with horses. And here's a horse painting from the Western tradition where Caravaggio uh, has this simultaneous projection and plunge. Right? The figure is both like coming out at you and there's these great dark depths that you can sink into, uh, perhaps implying the depths of human experience. And the other thing I like about this painting is that, you know, probably if you made a list of the 100 most beautiful paintings in the Western canon, one of them would be a painting of a horse's ass. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Um, subtlety versus boldness. Um, here's a, a kind of water study. Um, again, a lot of emptiness, uh, a lot of implication, uh, and a sense of the flow, a very kind of Taoist notion, as opposed to what we do in the West, uh, <laughs> which is often very much in your face, uh, very active. I loved your opening quote about you are so aggressive and <laughs> I am so peaceful. Um, you can see the cultural contrast here. You know? <laughs> and also pop art was one of the first instances where the medium was brought to the fore that you know this was the age of the, me the medium is the message. <laughs> um, and pop art you know, taught us to look at those modalities, the modalities of, of advertising and comics and film, uh, and to realize that we seldom ever apprehend the world straight. We get it via all of these different vehicles and instruments. Uh, and essence and appearance. Um, if you look at a work like this, depicting a lotus, but depicting it not as it would look if you had a lotus in your hand, beholding it, but its essence, its ideal lotusness, <laughs> right? Um, as opposed to the more typical Western approach where you have a kind of you know, clinical scrutiny uh, where you can see you know, every bend and every petal and every bug on the stem. Um, and my, my point throughout is not to, you know, argue the superiority of one method to the other. It's simply to point out this difference and, um, and the kinds of translation problems that it gives rise to. Um, calligraphy versus text. This, for people who are not in Eastern studies, is one of the most baffling of Eastern art forms, calligraphy. Um, because it, to us it looks like a text, and yet the text is not what matters. What matters is how it is written. Right? Uh, very often, even with Chinese friends, you know, you'll see an example of ancient calligraphy, and you'll be admiring it, and you know, you'll talk about, oh, the, you know, the flow of energy in this brush stroke or the firmness, or the wispiness, or what have you, you know, characteristic of each calligrapher. And then you'll ask, well, but what does it say? And well, uh, I don't know, you know, it's written in classical characters. I don't really, uh, it's a, a poem from the Tang Dynasty or something, you know. That isn't what matters. Now, to a Westerner, that's extremely peculiar, right? It's as though, you know, someone, or a hundred different people had written the Gettysburg Address in different handwritings, and all you looked at was the handwriting and not what is contained in the message of the Gettysburg Address. Um, very different from the use of text in Western painting. Um, you know, just about everyone knows this example from Magritte, um, which kind of plays with this notion that comes up 
later in, in Lichtenstein about like uh, on the top half you sort of, you have a kind of picture, you know, a kind of model of the world. Okay, there is something in the world that looks like this. You know, you could find one and you could pick it up. Um, and underneath you have a word, uh, a language game, uh, denying what your eyes are telling you above. You know, this is not a pipe. But the, uh, another interesting thing to note here is that everyone knows this work. Everyone knows the inscription, this is not a pipe. I'll bet you not one person in a hundred could tell you without looking that the inscription is in cursive rather than printed because that's not what matters <laughs> in this work as opposed to calligraphy. Um, all of this sort of culminating in this, I think, really major underlying cultural difference or aesthetic difference, harmony versus conflict. Um, you know, this is the great you know, yin yang symbol uh, suggesting this fundamental balance between male and female, hot and cold, warm and soft, that, that the entire cosmos uh, is a self-regulating, self-balancing system. Uh, and this has political implications as well, right? Because the well-ordered society is the sign of good government, right? And this is coming out of a culture that has virtually always had an, an empire, a central authority, and very specific regulations, very specific roles for father, son, governor, uh, et cetera. As opposed to Western notion, where you have similar forms, but they're in direct conflict. I mean, there, Delacroix has this with two horsemen, two, two cavalrymen fighting. He has another one that's very similar in composition with, with a tagger, a horseman and a tagger. So between the two, you have the struggle with nature and then the struggle with other people. Um, and this, again, goes beyond the aesthetic because our political notion is about the conflict of interests. Uh, but the best, not the neatest, not the most peaceful way uh, to come to solutions is for each party to act on behalf, of, on behalf of its own interest. And you fight it out and eventually some kind of compromise is reached, uh, as opposed to having a, a central authority who says, it shall be so, you know? <laughs> um, and then finally, the, the last problem that, that Chinese artists face in, in trying to uh, promulgate their with their works abroad is this notion of lateness, of course. Um, with the great opening up in the 80s, all of these foreign influences came flooding in, and people responded to them very enthusiastically. But it looks peculiar to Western eyes. Here's Andy Warhol, 1972. He does his Mao prints, you know. Um, And of course, Warhol is an inspirational figure to many artists in China. And here we are, what, 27 years later, with a Chinese artist doing something that looks very similar. Um, now, there's two arguments. One is that you have to see this in its own context, and within its own context, it was inventive or is inventive. Um, but the other, which you often encounter, is a kind of critical resistance of, look, you know, we've seen this before. You're not doing anything new. Um, why do you bother? <laughs> um, and that's a, a tough question to answer. Um, the upshot at the moment kind of looks like this in terms of popular acceptance and activity within the market. This is from 
2017. Uh, there was a time a few years ago when China was the second largest art market in the world, almost inching out the United States. Uh, that has since changed considerably, um, with the U.S. now at 42 percent and China at 21, and virtually two to one difference. Um, and the other thing that's <laughs> educational and frightening in a way is to look at how small all the other percentages are. You know, places like Germany, which we think of as a major art scene, in terms of the market, hardly count at all. <laughs> it's 2% of the total, right? Um, and if you tally up all of the Western figures, it comes to, what is it, twin? Sorry. Was <laughs> I can 73% of the total. And Asia and all others come to 27. <laughs> um, this reminds me of a, a talk I once gave in, in uh, Korea, um, which I called the 30% solution, because uh, people in our business very often when you travel abroad encounter this question. It always it comes in different forms, but the underlying question is always essentially the same, which is, how do I get a show in New York? <laughs> Um, <laughs> and so one time, just sort of, you know, tongue-in-cheek, I did a lecture showing slides of artists, Asian artists who had succeeded in the Western market, you know, Nam Chung Paik and Murakami, et cetera. What about Japan? Japan's hmm? Japan <laughs> Less than 1%. Less than 1%. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so as a kind of pointed joke, uh, I said to the people, well, you know, if you want to succeed in the Western market, you should make your, your work 70% Western global style <laughs> and 30% <laughs> Asian, right? Because Westerners want to be able to relate to it, right? right? but then they want something a little bit different. <laughs> so you throw in that 30% factor. Uh, to my horror, I then you know, looked out at the audience and saw people dutifully taking notes. <laughs> They're gonna go back to the studio and <laughs> attempt to fulfill that. Uh, um, in any case, we're now, whoops. We're now in a situation of neo-nationalism, as you all well know, uh, not only as regards the United States and China, but as regards many other countries as well. Um, and, <laughs> you know, uh, China got Xi Jinping in 2013, and he is now installed in office for life. We got Trump in 2017. He may have a second term. <laughs> um, so the short run <laughs> uh, is not particularly promising in terms of cultural uh, cooperation and friendship. Uh, I still believe <laughs> that in the long run, globalism and, and even the kind of monocultural will prevail. Uh, but we have to acknowledge that history despite Hegel, is not terribly linear. <laughs> it doesn't go smoothly from point A to point B. Um, it's full of advances and retractions, uh, false starts, et cetera, and it, it, it tends to spiral. And so eventually, you know, <laughs> as you're spiraling around, you do get over here uh, to a more progressive state of affairs, perhaps. Um, but it's going to be a much more complicated process than any of us would wish. And uh, I think it makes what we do in the cultural domain all that much more important. So thank you.
Thank you, Richard. Um, as the moderator of this panel, um, I am having the pleasure of introducing um, our next panelist in this very exciting panel, co Collecting Chinese Contemporary and Beyond. Um, Charles Jing is a photographer, collector, and an entrepreneur. And he started his career um, as a photo editor of Shanghai Pictorial Magazine. And uh, in 1989, he came to the United States and uh, later received an MFA in photography from Maryland Institute of College of Art. Um, very impressive is that he has accumulated over 2,000 works by uh, masters of the 20th um, century, uh, non-Chinese, right? Mainly non-Chinese uh, photography, and also more than 1,600 contemporary Chinese uh, photographers' works. Um, and uh, his, his collection has been presented in many museums um, in China, traveling around. Um, and he has served as a judge in major international photo festivals and exhibitions. And uh, in 2014, he acquired Paris SIPA uh, Press and became chairman of the board of directors. So let's hear uh, what Charles has to say about his passion for collecting photography. Thank you. Which I just click, excuse me. I just uh, enter one by one. We can use this one. Okay. This one. Yeah, this one. Okay, now I can twist from here. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to thank, uh, thank uh, Zhang Fang and Natsu that you made me come to here to join a group of uh, most professional people. Uh, I be basically, I learned a lot from all. So I'm um, just, wet. it's very hard for me to prepare, uh, well prepared to do this kind of lecture or speaking because I was extremely busy in and out a lot. I was uh, travel for like 35 trip during first, three qu first, first quarter in, in, in this year. So basically, I was uh, slammed, overwhelmed. But I'm so happy to come to have a very brief uh, introduction to my, my, my uh, collection of the photography. Uh, I'm going to say this. Uh, basically, when I started, basically, I, see I need to answer three questions. When uh, and how and uh, uh, what, OK? When uh, I first started from when I, I, I basically I graduated was in 1992 uh, from Marin Institute College of Art. Uh, it's a good school, but uh, I was the first ever accepted Chinese student in uh, 163 years. Uh, when I got here, I speak very little English. Uh, life was miserable. Uh, China was very poor. I got in 1989. I believe the entire country's uh, total revenue <coughs> roughly equivalent to the General Motor uh, Ford. I believe it's total, if I'm not mistaken, 30 billion US dollar. So uh, when I, uh, I, st I started the photo uh, program, I was uh, totally shocked. Basically, my teacher, uh, my instructor, uh, my teacher was uh, instructor was Will Larson. Unfortunately, he just died two days ago. Uh, he's a uh, he's a uh, 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 master Wimberlook and uh, Alan Sinskin student, and uh, he's win uh, Guggenheim and NEA three times. It's very got all the crazy idea, but he's very very creative uh, person. Uh, Basically, my background was a photojournalist in China. Uh, when I came to 100% art school, I was totally, it's like uh, I described myself, I was in the, the, the cooker, I created, uh, cooked Chinese food for 30 years. Uh, suddenly, 
they dropped me in the, the kitchen to cook the Western style food. It was totally, uh, it's very, very hard for me. For after year or two, I was uh, uh, I learned a lot from, uh, from my chairman uh, of a photo department, uh, Will, Jack Wilgus. He basically graduated from uh, Art Institute of Chicago. You know what? Why I um, started to collect photographs? Because the first day he taught, he's in the photo history class, he brought a bunch of uh, vintage prints when he collected when he was a student. Back to that time, he only paid like two or three hundred dollars. I saw the picture of uh, uh, Henry Callahan, a bunch of uh, vintage. I was totally unbelievable. And uh, so after graduated, the life was miserable. So I, nobody hires me. The most uh, students, they, they, they still uh, hang out uh, around the school as a plumber or something. They join the drink beer, attending the uh, opening. I say, I'm out. I have to make money. So I moved to South, uh, little by little, very lucky. So I started to sell Chinese products and uh, made money. Uh, very fortunately, very blessing, I, I sold the uh, 2004, I got in the Home Depot and Lowe's. So business was really took off in uh, 2005. So I started to collect the photograph in 2006 immediately. Uh, I, I still remember the first time I went to APAD, I bought 30 pieces of uh, uh, picture from, uh, from a, a variety gallery, a few gallery, and uh, I believe it 20, uh, at least uh, Total 30 prints, I bought a 20 prints is Henry Callahan because it's got the inspired by Jack Wilgus and uh, I liked the work very much. After that, I believe it's, uh, I got the collected, it was called uh, from, uh, right now I'm the major, I believe, uh, according to people, the gallery owner told me I'm the biggest Henry Callahan private collector in the world. I have a, I bought a, like a vintage prints from uh, Peter McGill. Uh, over total is roughly total image. I have over 200 pieces. And uh, back to 2010, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, there's one Chinese delegate that came to over to visit me in Atlanta. Uh, after that, the trouble was really started, and uh, the, when they came, uh, when they. Uh, they back to Beijing, they talked to Kafa Museum director uh, Wang Huangshen. They said that we know there's one poor Chinese, he's got a bunch of collect collection. And uh, after they, they threw the midman uh, approach me, they said if you, you, we can borrow some works from you. And uh, I said sure, I said uh, what kind of money do you ask? I said I don't want to ask money. I even paid all the insurance transportation shipped to them. Uh, then uh, it was show was big hit in China. Uh, I believe it's 2011. And uh, after that, then the, the show the travel so many cities in China, major city, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, Wuhan, uh, Xi'an, Shenyang, and uh, uh, Hangzhou. And the travel seven city, and uh, the people started know me and. Uh, so after that, there's a, so far for past like uh, eight or nine years, a total in China is, a show, is a more than, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 14 or 15 uh, show, but each, is, uh, each theme is different. Um, so I started in the three years after, roughly 2013 or 14, I can't remember exactly the year, before that, I know Chinese photographer with zero because I left China almost uh, 20, 21 years. I just uh, use all my energy uh, devoted to the business, making money, and uh, I know very little by Chinese photography. So um, I believe it's uh, started 2014. Probably it is time for me to collect the uh, some photo pho photography, Chinese contemporary, because of uh, I feel obligated. Uh, so many people, they have uh, some, some kind of high expectation. So I can show you a few, it's uh, what kind of work, and uh, that's the reason uh, this morning, Christopher, the, the lecturer, I was very 
very interesting to me. Some of the people, some of the work he brought in the show, the first show. After that, I just talked to a few people. If I want to collect the uh, 10 photographers, which is the 10? You gave me the list. So I talked to more than 20 people. So I decided I just uh, very aggressively buy all the most of the major pieces. Uh, I'm sorry. This is a major piece from uh, Ching Song. I believe it's the edition of three. But I, uh, there's not available. There's three all sold. Uh, but I bought a small one like this big. It's uh, uh, Ching Song gave the gallery owner, I believe it's an auction gallery owner in France. Then they sold to me. Uh, it's not working. I'm sorry. This is the one, I believe it's the first blood that we, uh, we did in uh, last year in the Paris photo. It's well uh, received. Uh, there's many people interested. Uh, this is uh, Ren Hang. He, he died, and I, I believe the people, everybody knows it. Uh, I bought it. When I bought it very, very uh, few years ago, it basically is very, inexp inexp uh, very inexpensive. Uh, this is everybody knows Liu Boling is uh, become a big and uh, I have uh, his uh, major collection. Uh, this is uh, Chou Zhijie. He's a dean of uh, uh, Central Academy of Art. You know what? Uh, this piece, tattoo series, uh, it edition of ten. I believe it started in 1994. You know, uh, I did some research. Back to that time, this piece sold for. 1800 RMB, 18, which is roughly $200. By the time I bought this, uh, I paid 100 times more, which is 25,000 euro. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, on, I only have four pieces. Total is, I believe it's uh, eight pieces. Uh, this is uh, Zhang Wei. It's a uh, recent year emerging. I believe it's uh, uh, he is inspired by the one German artist. I believe it's, there's uh, some kind of controversial when he introduced the market. But I have his, almost I bought every single one, the series from uh, uh, Zhang Wei. Uh, this is a Cui Xiu when she died, I believe it's uh, uh, years ago or two years, I can't remember. And uh, this is a uh, major guy, Hai Bo. Uh, this image is the uh, first ever uh, Metropolitan Museum uh, collect the first Chinese photographer, uh, Hai Bo. Uh, this is uh, A Chang. <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, um, I bought a, his all series with every single woman. Right now, he's going to shoot in another one. He married, uh, finally, settled with one girl. I told him if you are. If you're, you, you date uh, the girl overnight stand, and I'm gonna bankrupt because I it's very very <laughs> very very expensive. Okay, I I bought it, like, all of them, but I, he's a personally friend. He's very very good person, very good man. Uh, I like him a lot. This is I just show a few pieces. Uh, this is uh, 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 Liu 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 Liu, and everybody know him. Okay. He's a, a very, I'm gonna very intense person, and the image is very, very, very hard. Uh, this is uh, Peng Xiangjie. It's uh, I, I'm not sure he's very well known, but he's uh, he's basically is uh, 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 trying to inspired by uh, Dian Abbas. Okay, I have to say this. Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, Rongrong and uh, the East Village. Uh, Rong Rong, I, I have a few pieces of Rong Rong. Actually, we're a very good friend. This is Rong Rong. Uh, this is uh, Wang Ningde. Uh, his, uh, I have uh, his like uh, six or seven pieces. Uh, actually, this one is a uh, run advertising in the uh, art, uh, uh, American Art Magazine uh, for one issue, this one. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Wang Yishu. It's uh, it's got uh, some kind of uh, 
humor in the image, and they have a Ma Xi Tuan. Uh, it's with the old Chinese building, and uh, I believe it's a very striking image for a Westerner. Uh, this is uh, Wang Xiaohui. We, uh, uh, but she's a uh, uh, artist. That, uh, I believe she went to abroad in Germany, and she came. She's uh, basically the architect. Uh, this is uh, Yang Fudong, Yang Fudong, uh, and uh, Yao Lu. is uh, graduated from uh, uh, Kafa, uh, not Central. Uh, and this is uh, Yu Xiao. It's uh, Yao Lu's student. Uh, his you know, and Zhang Da Li. Uh, of course, Zhang Huan. Zhang Huan. I, I have uh, this series, entire series. Uh, and uh, Zhang Xiao. Uh, Zhang Xiao is. Uh, uh, he's, uh, I believe, uh, 30 something, 35 to 40, and he win the uh, Harvard uh, last year, some kind of robber something award, which is 50,000 grand. He's become uh, bigger now. Uh, just uh, recently, they, they, uh, they just uh, will have a show very uh, in Beijing. It's a big show by the Yulin Si. I, I don't know how to in translate the English. It's a major, uh, major uh, museum in Beijing. Uh, this is uh, Xing Dan Wen, uh, who just mentioned. I believe it's uh, Christopher. Xing Dan Wen is a lady. Um, and uh, Jiang Zhi is graduated from uh, uh, Zhejiang Art Institute. This is Zhong Ning, another big, uh, big uh, artist, emerging artist. This is what the show, major show in China, Zhonghua uh, Shi I don't know how to translate it. Uh, it's uh, four, four or five years ago. It's my major Chinese contemporary uh, collection show. It's almost take the entire floor, huge show. It's like a total 140 pieces. Uh, this is... Uh, Look at the series of uh, Zhang Huan and uh, Hong Hao, then uh, over there, uh, Hai Bo. Uh, this was the show in uh, uh, Paris photo. And uh, I own the one gallery called SIPA Gallery, C-I-P-A Gallery in Beijing. Uh, I also own the SIPA Press, S-I-P-A, which is a French photo agency. Right now, it's the uh, second largest photo agency in the world after Getty. We have a SIPA USA, SIPA Paris, uh, SIPA China. And uh, it's a very old photo agency. Basically, it's editorial. It's not uh, art related. OK, this is uh, how I'm going to move to the next one. Uh, I, have, I can show you, but I only have a 20 minutes. I give you very brief introduction. I can show you some Western art collection, uh, uh, the major. Uh, Western art and uh, how many pieces, who is the major when I collect, I can show you a few slides. Uh, I started, basically, I started 2006. And uh, right now, for uh, my, let's say this, my, the collection total percentage is, uh, I believe it's Western Master is uh, 70%. 70%, I believe it's 10% is a documentary photographer, like uh, Kadia Blasun, uh, W. Eugene Smith, Joseph Kudaka. Uh, Sargado, and uh, it's mainly docu documentary uh, master. Forty percent, uh, it's uh, forty percent is contemporary, and the rest of them is uh, classic, Western. It's uh, Richard Avedon. Uh, I have a few pieces. Uh, 
uh, Irving Penn is a this is a scenic Scotland's in my major collection. I have uh, more than 15 pieces of uh, big one, all the big one. In my opinion, she is basically undervalued. Okay, in my opinion. Uh, when I, 1990, when I was in Baltimore, Maryland Institute College of Art, there's one guy that showed his image. And uh, I was totally shocked. I just got here a few months. I said, how can image make that big? It's so striking. And uh, I was told by people, they, uh, the, the dog, the sculpture, uh, she's only make one image per year. Very, very striking. So I, after that, when I made money, I bought this one immediately. Uh, I believe it's very early, many years ago. I can't remember. I have all the major major series, the big big one. So uh, uh, this is uh, William Eggleston. William Eggleston. Uh, this is unique prints, die transfer. Uh, I have a uh, believe. Uh, Eggleston is my major collection. I believe it's, uh, if I'm not me, somewhere 30 to 40 pieces. Uh, I have, have a five or 10 of uh, unique prints, die transfer. I don't know why he made only made one, but it's, uh, I was bought by a decent gallery. They, they can prove it. Uh, Lisa Modell, it's uh, uh, Abbas, uh, what is a teacher. And uh, Lisa Modell, I have a, uh, 20 or something. Of course, uh, Salimian. Salimian is, a, is my major, major collection. I have over 85 to 90. Okay. Uh, all the image, uh, I basically received email call every day. People think, Charles, we found one, then they send me one, then they buy one. So it's, uh, it's kind of a uh, uh, Paul Strand, that's a, I consider is a classic. And uh, Alan Sinskin, Alan, Alan Sinskin, I afterwards after uh, Callahan, I, I buy uh, uh, Sinskin, but uh, I have uh, a lot. Basically, he's he's uh, not just uh, why I'm buy so much uh, Callahan and Sinskin. Because it's, I believe it's, they are part of a contemporary uh, history of a photography. They were both on a teach in the Black Mountain and the North Carolina. They were with, uh, believe it or not, Rauschenberg. There were three faculty at the photo department. Uh, fortunately, I bought a, uh, last year, there one dealer, I bought a bunch of uh, Rauschenberg a black and white photograph when they, he did in the Black Mountain College. Uh, this is my company. I bought one time. I bought it. Shinji uh, German, the big one. It's, I have to stand there. There's no way I can take a picture. Shinji uh, German. I have a, a bunch. Around 30 pieces. Recently, I bought it. Uh, this is uh, the German guy. Is uh, represented by uh, David Zuner as a uh, Wolfgang Tillman. Uh, yeah, Tillman. Yeah. And uh, this is a documentary, it's a major pieces. Uh, uh, I own it from a good cut. Uh, obviously, Richard Prince, I have a few. Uh, like Eugene Smith, uh, Robert Maypursaw. Robert Maypursaw is uh, my major collection. Uh, this is unique prints. Uh, he did in 1978, he even made a picture frame. He's a, it's like carpenter. He's a, sometimes it's very strange. He's not uh, uh, print uh, black and white. He's uh, he's making a frame. I believe it's last year Paris photo. Uh, uh, Patty Smith, the word image is a Patty Smith portrait. That frame is made by Maple So okay. Uh, I don't know why. He's just uh, I have a major pieces of uh, Maple So. You know the the guy. Uh, Sometimes we have uh, some kind of uh, collector. We, uh, we, we have some kind of meeting at the, the party or the gallery each year. The guy, uh, he said uh, he bought the first one at the show. Back to that time, this piece, $750, 1980s. I can't remember. He's an edition of number four. Mine is a number six. This is the book of the Maple Thaw. Uh, when I buy this, this, this piece, it's almost a few hundred times more, pay, pay more. 
but it's still worth it. But uh, I still keep this. And uh, maple saw, I have uh, over 90 pieces, but I never buy from the foundation. Every single piece is signed by maple saw. Uh, this is Herb, Herb Ritz uh, in Hollywood, big guy. And some uh, master I consider this type of stuff is uh, called classic, Billy Brad. Uh, Diane Albus, you know the Diane Albus, uh, five years ago, I got one dealer approached me and uh, they said they have a set of uh, Abbas, every single print printed by Abbas, 113 pieces. And I bought them all. I never show anyone. Right now it's still in the, my uh, Atlanta box, eight boxes total. Uh, which is uh, uh, Abbas, I think, is very important in the, in the modern photography. Uh, this is one of the Callahan. Callahan, basically, I uh, have a lot. Uh, Tsuchimoto. I don't have many Japanese uh, phot uh, photo, uh, but if, uh, he's the only one I have a bunch. Uh, Lee Freelander is a documentary photographer. W. G. Smith. This is uh, I consider the uh, classic is a uh, uh, Edward Weston. Uh, I believe this photograph is a uh, mistress. This one, if you learn, uh, I believe it's, if you get in the, the, you know more about the collection, you can tell when Edward signed the signature, it meant them with Harry in it, definitely before 1930. After 1930. He always signed Edward Weston, where Henry, the mid name, were missing. Okay, it's uh, he's uh, uh, and uh, I, I have a bunch of his uh, vintage work. Uh, this one I said I consider is uh, mm, mm, contemporary. It's uh, two years ago. It's in Paris photo. I bought a, a Pace McGill. This is a Richard Misarage. It's uh, a contemporary photographer. It's a big one. And uh, David Hockney, I have a bunch. Uh, David Hockney. Um, this is unique prints. That one, uh, the, the one I shoot, just uh, uh, this is unique. Jeff Koons. Jeff Koons is a, it's hard to find. I only have a two pictures. One is a Polaroid, he photographed himself, portrait. This is when he did, I believe it's uh, for some kind of a uh, project. But it, it's not very expensive, but it's hard to find it. Uh, as uh, yesterday, it was, it was, uh, I can't remember who is talking about Jeff Koons. Actually, the, I, Jeff Koons graduated from Mecca. So he's probably the most famous name uh, from the Mecca. So I'm the poorest Chinese from Mecca. So we're, uh, this uh, uh, Alex Prager, uh, Alex Prager. Uh, as Gursky. Uh, Anna Gursky, uh, uh, Annie Leibovitz, and Leibovitz major, this is what I consider as a major piece. I have, I bought it two. One is a uh, uh, Cibachrome, one is uh, black wine. Dorothy Lane, uh, Cadia Bloisson. Cadia Bloisson, I have a major collection, over 100 pieces. Uh, uh, Kappa. The, uh, all my collection, there is only one person, or two person with no signature. One is Kappa, another VV, Vivian Meyer. Vivian Meyer only bought one, not many. It's not my major collection. Uh, you know, that's uh, uh, Elliot. And uh, Sargado. Sargado, uh, I have uh, the whole series of uh, uh, the mining people, worker, uh, Irving Penn. That's the one I bought it from uh, uh, Rosenberg. T Twelve pieces. I'm, uh, I also have a few very rare Robert Frank. Robert Frank did this one in 1919, uh, 19, I believe it's 56, if I'm not mistaken. It's uh, all vintage. Uh, 
Robert Frank. It's very, right now, Robert Frank is very, very hot in the market. It's very, very hard to find it. Believe it or not, when I started 10 years ago, uh, no, 13 years ago, Robert Frank, it's easy to find the prints like uh, $8,000, $10,000. Right now, the major piece is over $150,000. Very, very expensive now. Uh, Mahori Nash. Uh, Mahori Nash, I have uh, 15 or 20. Uh, this is Vic Muniz. A few pieces. Uh, Thomas Strews. I have a more like a Candida Hoffer, uh, Thomas Loop. Uh, this is a big master of uh, mm, John Balseri and uh, uh, Barbara Cougar. I have all of them. But you, for some reason, uh, John Balseri, Barbara Cougar in China, it's not well known at all. Another one, for example, uh, Star Twins. When I got here 30 years ago, they are already established. And I, I, I went to Baltimore, to, uh, the, the teacher took us to show there. I was totally shocked. But right now, it's even today, not many people know uh, Star Twins in China. So basically, it's, uh, I'm not sure it's 20, uh, 20 minutes, so I, hopefully I will <laughs> I'm not disappoint people. So, and uh, basically, we're connected. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I have uh, so much things going on. I own a three factory in China and uh, nine companies all over the world. And this year, I started a new, new venture with making hydrogen cell power truck now. So basically, it's driving me crazy. <laughs> Very exhausted, but uh, uh, I just have to keep going. And uh, hopefully, I have uh, uh, make more money collect more photos. <laughs> Someday I donate somewhere. You never know. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for um, exciting us with your wonderful and growing collection. Um, our next speaker and also the last speaker of this panel is Anthony Chaporo. So I know that you are a graduate of University of Michigan, so welcome back. Um, and your field of study is uh, medicine. So like Charles, you know, both of you are Renaissance men, can do everything. Um, Anthony and his sister, Marianne um, Japur, uh, are based in Miami, and they have a lovely private family art collection, which includes post-war contemporary art. Um, but also you mentioned that the core of the collection is really the Chinese contemporary art. Um, and uh, we are very envious of you because um, the works in your collection are specifically curated within the space in which um, you live. The collection as a whole engages the viewer in a dialogue that offers uh, fresh insights into the world in which we live. So let's hear from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daisy. Uh, uh, first, thanks to Fong. Where is she? Oh, there she is back there for inviting me. This was a year ago that she invited me because she said she wanted to do something. And I said, Fong, I am so busy. You've got to give me a lot of time if you're going to plan something like this. So she started talking about this a year ago. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it is true that uh, I did graduate from here. On the science side, and it's taken me 35 years to come back. <laughs> the last time I was here was when my sister graduated from the University of Michigan in 1984, and I have not been back since. And yesterday, I had a great tour with a, a medical colleague of mine, uh, Mirt, and she took me all around town. And 
later when um, Fang was driving uh, Charles and I back, I said, it's so nice to be back, but what is really special about it is coming back for this. I'm not somebody who uh, likes to go to reunions and reminisce and see buildings. They don't have any meaning to me, but to come back and to see an artist, uh, your husband, uh, Wang Ching Song uh, with a solo show here. I think I'm the largest collector of his work, definitely in Florida, maybe in the United States, I don't know. Uh, to be here at my alma mater is really quite amazing to me and to see that fantastic exhibition downstairs, which I think is, is so interesting. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be back. Um, I've been a collector my whole life. My grandmother started me collecting coins and bottles. And I learned to tell the difference between a coin that was worth five cents and a coin that was worth $50. I also learned the difference between bottles, a bottle that was worth a, do a dollar and a bottle that was worth $100. So I've been really collecting my entire life. Um, I didn't become seriously interested in the visual arts until I was at Harvard um, in, in, in my medical program because I lived a few blocks away from the Isabella Star Stewart Gardner Museum and the Boston MFA. And after doing cadaveric works with you know, dead bodies and such, we kind of put all that behind and we would go and listen to the music at, at the Gardner Museum and then walk across the street to the MFA. And that's when I became really interested in the visual arts. And I'm self-educated. I would go with all my medical uh, travels. I would finish my medical work, and I would go to the museums and galleries. I would buy the catalogs, and I would read like cover to cover Picasso, uh, Manet, all of the artists. And since I have kind of a photographic memory, I retain information extremely well, uh, particularly uh, visual. Um, the best art lecture I ever heard was by Robert Storr, who said, um, you won't understand my slides, and you won't understand what I'm saying, but just take home this message. So that's what I'm going to say. The take home message is that I truly believe that the Chinese contemporary artists are the Picassos and Muros of our generation. Uh, they might be in a lull. They might need a reboot. But I do feel that this group of artists from, um, the, from, that were born in the 1960s and 70s and are the, the grown-ups of the Cultural Revolution right after it was opened up, really, as a group, bring so much um, important is history um, to the 21st century uh, contemporary art canon. I had a gallery for 10 years. I was on a sabbatical from medicine. Um, and Chinese contemporary photography and Chinese contemporary art was kind of like my thesis, if you will, in the art world. Uh, our collection really uh, is uh, sculpture, a lot of sculpture, a lot of painting. Uh, so what you're going to see really is the core of the family collection, which is in Chinese. I closed the gallery to um, operations in 2012 and really been focusing on the family collection since then. So. Uh, we've heard it today, but you know, uh, for the people that came in later, including my, my cousin and her husband, thanks for coming. Um, what defines Chinese contemporary art is art that's been created uh, after the uh, closing of the uh, Cultural Revolution, which was uh, art created after 1978 and 79. When you're collecting for your own family collection, you have to have um, reasons uh, to buy, and I'm not going to enumerate them here, but the most important art uh, comes out of cultures that are going through a lot of social change, and that is definitely the case for China. Uh, China has gone through such inque incredible change over the last 30 to 40 years that this is why Chinese contemporary art is so important. What do I look, look at? I look at the background of the artist. Um, what is their international recognition? What is their work product? Is the work seminal? And I'm going to try to explain to you, whereas Charles is collecting volumes and collecting large, I, we are collecting very tightly. And so I can tell you exactly why we have not only collected the artist, but this specific work. 
um, who is representing the artists? And the Chinese contemporary artists really haven't still to this day been embraced by the Western galleries. Most of us got our work um, privately or through the auction houses. Um, who's collecting their work? And what you'll see, what you've seen today is we keep showing the same images over and over. That means that those people's works must be very important because we, we did not uh, coordinate our slideshows, but you'll see a lot of the same works um, since Melissa's uh, conversation this morning with us. What is the market for the work? I mean, I, I can't just buy art just for the sake of buying art. I have to be able to resell that piece and at least get the money that I put into it. What I say is if you know, the roof caves in and I need money, I have, my, I have to be able to sell this art. So I look at the secondary market of, of, of those artists and do they even have a secondary market? The reputation of the people selling their work, are they uh, honorable dealers? Um, we all know of, of dealers that say, oh, this is a very important artist. Uh, it's an investment piece of work, and, and later we find out that's definitely not the case. You could never resell it. Um, art that stands on its own, um, and, and really the, the, how, how I'm going to acquire the piece. Um, I don't know if people realize that Wang Ching Song um, has the world record for the most expensive pieces at auction. Um, the work that, that Charles showed, the whole piece, which i showing just a portion of it, Follow Me from 2003 has several world records of $700,000 and $800,000 for, um, for, for one photograph at auction. So he has already made it in, in, in history and his work continues to, to be important. I want to back up for a moment and, and talk about a little bit more broadly about Chinese contemporary art as a whole and go to painting. Um, and then go, go into um, photography because my whole life has always been about bridging and bridging in this context the East and the West. Uh, I feel that, that we do, we, you know, as, as, as uh, Richard was saying, we're all old friends. We've seen each other in Hong Kong. We've seen each other in New York. This is the time for a rebooting of Chinese contemporary art um, in the world because as he said, there was this hysteria for it just around the time that I got into it, and everybody said, oh, he's brilliant. But, um, it, it, but then at the, after the 2008 uh, financial crisis, it completely, the market completely collapsed, and you're totally right. People like me took a st step back and said, hmm, should I keep putting money into this or should I pause? And I have not bought another uh, Chinese piece since then, 2008. Uh, we ha but it forced me to go back to my own country, the United States. We have a lot of LA artists in our, in our, in our collection now. We have um, uh, a lot of African American artists. Um, we have uh, Mexican, Spanish. Uh, we have Kahindi Wiley who, who painted the president. I couldn't give those pieces away several years ago. I would buy, buy one of his pieces each year. Ever since he did President Obama's portrait, uh, the prices are five times what they were and 10 times what they were before. So um, uh, Yu Min Jun, we all know, is a very important artist um, in terms of his um, artistic output because he represents so much uh, what the Chinese people uh, are feeling um, in China, which uh, he always paints his own face, uh, always smiling, but the smile has a very different meaning in the Chinese culture and, and really in Asian culture. Just because someone's smiling doesn't mean they're happy. And when, when they nod, all they're doing is recognizing they're hearing you, but it don't mean yes. They could be doing this, but it doesn't mean yes. So the interpretation of his works, you can see um, this is uh, uh, The Forbidden City, you see uh, some men um, smiling and laughing like it's no big deal what's going on, and it looks kind of happy. Uh, in fact, a lot of the visual um, aesthetic of the Asian artworks is animation, uh, this being one. This is called The Execution. It was hidden from the public. Um, it, was, it was done in 1995, and it didn't come out into the public until about 10 years later because it represented, it represented the Tiananmen Square massacre, massacre, but it doesn't look like that because you don't see any guns. 
This is me visiting the artist studio back in 2007. Um, and you can see his works. Uh, he did a lot of, of works, that, and you can see that it looks like him in, in all the paintings. But in terms of bridging back to Western art and why this, his art is important, is if you look at, at Goya's work from the 3rd of May, um, uh, 1808, the execution of the Defenders of Madrid, you see an image that looks very much like the work that Yuman Jin did. Manet did his version um, called The Execution of, of the Emperor Maximilian in, in the 1860s. Uh, Picasso did his version. So art history builds on itself. Uh, and the Chinese are taking yet a, net, a step further. If you just go back to this, you do not see a gun. What is the artist saying? that the Chinese government has such control over its people that it doesn't even need to use a gun to control them. This is what I find so interesting about Chinese contemporary art. And when it burst out into, um, uh, into uh, American collectors, is, it was because there was a hunger for something new. We all knew Andy Warhol. We all knew all the artists, and we were sort of I can't say bored, but we were bored of seeing the same thing over and over. And what the Chinese brought is something fresh, new, and what we were looking for. When this was sold in 07, the estimate was 2.9 million, and it actually sold for 5.9 million, double its estimate. And this was only one of several um, uh, uh, records that were set in Chinese contemporary art. The other one was Zhang Fanzi. Um, the collector who owned this was a, a collector of mine. Again, you see the smiling faces. This is the mask series. And what it, to me, what I found so interesting about it is again the smiling faces. But how do the Chinese people really feel about what was happening in their culture? Uh, they can't really show their emotions. They have to keep their emotions hidden because of an author. author, author authoritarian government. This was a diptych. The estimate was 1.9 million. It sold, sold for over, over 10, almost $10 million. This was back in 08. What's notable also is the big hands, which is, is uh, curators and, and academicians have said, liken it to Michelangelo's uh, David with the big hands and big feet as sort of the individual versus the government. So the Chinese were forced to hide their messages in their art because when you look up at a painting like this, there's, there, and it's got the red pioneer scarf, it doesn't look subversive, but yet it is. So now moving to photography, and we've seen a Zhang Wan's family tree multiple times today. So obviously, this is probably among the most important works in the whole uh, Chinese contemporary art canon. What I wanted to point out is it's not just the work, but the why. Why is photography and why is performance art so, so much at the core of Chinese contemporary? Because, as Charles was saying, the country was so poor that the artists couldn't even afford canvases and paints and brushes to do this work. All they had were their bodies. And so Zhang Wan did these performance works. Uh, the family tree is where they were doing uh, a Chinese custom of, 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 I don't know what, poems. But they were doing the calligraphy on his face over a period of hours until it was completely black. He did another work called 12 Square Meters where he was protesting the very tight quarters that the Chinese people were being forced to live in. He put um, uh, honey over his entire body and the bees were coming and licking it off. His works were extremely compelling and this is what appealed to me from an article I read back in 2003 in Art in America when you showed first the, uh, the, the contemporary photography and I never forgot it. Here another one that we saw earlier, how to add um, one meter to an anonymous mountain. And it, as Christopher was saying, the, 
the video part of this is very, very amusing. When you look at this, you think it's all women, but in fact, there were, they were mostly men. Um, and it does harken back to the ancient Chinese art with the mountains, but so fresh, so contemporary. Um, the Chinese don't have issues with nudity uh, as much as uh, we in the Western were a little bit more, um, af I'm not afraid, but a little bit shy with our bodies. When I visited China, I visited the, um, the collections of Chinese collectors, you see a, a lot more nudity in the works. So this is part of the Japur family collection. It is really the seminal uh, transition work for Wang Qingsong from back in 1998. Uh, so that's what, more than 20 years ago. To look at it now, you think, well, uh, and he was in his own pieces, very much like Cindy Sherman is in hers. And again, creating a bridge, I think doing an exhibition of Cindy Sherman and Wang Qingsong is a fantastic idea. All of you curators, please steal it and do it because this is how Chinese contemporary art gets more into the Western art. We have to do more linking to Western artists and not only do exhibitions just with the Chinese, with the Chinese, even though that's interesting. It took him six months to do each one of these pieces because the computer technology was so slow in China and that fascinated me because I'm all about technology. He's showing how fast the culture is changing by that blurriness in the background. I looked at so many uh, uh, photographs before I finally selected the ones uh, that I wanted to do in my show, and there was a reason for it. It was because these were so fascinating. The, uh, you see a man sitting on um, a piece of lettuce. He is like the burger on the McDonald's bun. And there's a McDonald's tattooed on his chest. The counter to it is the Coca-Cola cans uh, creating what looks like him behind bars. What is the artist saying? That McDonald's and Coca-Cola are putting Chinese people behind bars? Is it because it's not really healthy for us to be eating fast food? When the, in China, apparently at that time, Going to McDonald's was going to a fancy restaurant. I couldn't believe it, but it's true. The Chinese would get dressed up to go to McDonald's. And the first time that Ching Song left um, uh, China and went to the, to the West, he went to London. And he came out of the subway and he saw a McDonald's. And it was the dirtiest, ugliest uh, restaurant. And he said, the Western people, they're tricking us in China by making us think that their food is good, but it's terrible. And he developed a whole series of really anti-McDonald's um, uh, imagery from the 2003 because he was obsessed with the idea, I think, that it wasn't that the Chinese people were against um, Americans, individuals, but they were very suspicious of American corporations and what was their reasons for being in China to make money off of them. So this pair is um, an edition, I believe an it is an edition of 20. I would like to announce today to the University of Michigan, after talking to, to Fan, that if we can come to a good deal, the art of negotiation, that I will, will donate these to the University of Michigan. To this, to this, to this. <laughs> Uh, first of all, our entire collection is for loan any time of, of the year that you want to actually exhibit it. Um, it has to happen after I'm dead, so you have to just wait. <laughs> um, it has to be a good, uh, because I have donated to museums and things go into some storage unit and are never seen again. And I just do not want that to happen. So I'll be very strong in my negotiation and if we come up with something that works for everybody, great. And if it doesn't, I keep them. <laughs> so of course after I'm dead, I won't care. Um, but these are very, very special pieces. The good thing about the works that we collected is they're all museum pieces. So um, I, I feel very, very good. When I look at the thinker, and apparently this piece is very important to the artist. You see it in many of his, uh, of his other works. It, it does hearken uh, Rodin's The Thinker, which I recently just saw in Paris when I was there last fall for the art fair. 
um, you, you can see he's thinking, he's thinking. This is what makes art important from a, a historical point of view. I visited Wang Ching Song and, and found many years ago, this, was, this piece was coming up at auction at Sotheby's, and I was so used to seeing him in his works, but there are almost no men in this photograph. And the men that were in there were clearly not him. And I remember saying to Fan, well, where is he? And she said, well, here he is. You can barely see it, but this woman is holding a photograph up of, the, of him in the, behind the Coca-Cola bars. And since I had already owned that piece, I said, oh my god. So I was on the phone uh, bidding uh, that piece until, until I got it um, for our collection. And I also love it because it's called The Offering. And the meaning behind it is that apparently in Chinese culture, water is a very, very important symbol. An offering to the Buddha in the form of a woman is a hope of getting something back, usually money. One of the things that they are offering to her is a little doll. So these are the things I find found the Chinese contemporary art just very smart, beautiful to look at, but it has a lot of meaning behind it. We talked earlier about Shui Zhuan, who, who did pass away of cancer uh, last couple of years. We have this in our collection. Um, it's a 10-foot piece that had to be, there's actually also a 20-foot piece. Um, special framing had to be done. To me, when I looked at it, I thought of genetic cloning, being a doctor. W what I love about contemporary art is whatever you bring to it, whatever you see. My mother was always captivated by this little girl because she went to Catholic school, and the uniform made her think of, of, of going to Catholic school. People have always gravitated to this, but they don't understand why until I show them this. It is her version of the Last Supper. Every gesture is the same girl, but in the exact poses of um, Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. To me, what does this say about a culture that doesn't believe in any kind of organized religion? Very interesting. It was the same girl that she positioned in all these ways. It's called the three realms of Sanji because it exists in three realms. First, it exists at a, as a painting, which we know who owns that painting, Christopher and I do know. It, it, it is as a photograph and it is also as a video. And it's always been my dream to have a show with all three of those in the same room. I think it would be super interesting to see. This is another really seminal work by Wang Ching Song. It is the largest photograph in the entire world. It is um, 42 meters. It's an entire roll of photographic paper. And what is so interesting about it is um, it looks just flat, but those are many of those are real people that he staged the sets and um, put all this mud or whatever on them, and they're standing inside. The video to this work is amazing, and this is, a, I believe we were saying last night, is another piece. We have to find a place to show this work again, because it's so uh, incredible in terms of its meaning. Again, reaching back from east to west, and, and, and bridging between the two. This is another work of his that I, I particularly like from 2005, because it's showing, um, sort of the, 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 the Russian um, style of painting, which a lot of the Chinese were mimicking. You can see in the back the thinker, um, uh, which he brings in his pieces oftenly. You can also see the soldiers kind of watching, uh, like he's saying, like the government is watching the artists. They're letting them do their work, but they're watching them. And if there's a problem, they stop them. We have Haibo in our collection, like Charles does. This is day number seven. Why did I select this? Well, my mother is one of three sisters. My father is one of, 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 of three as well. I find this incredibly beautiful and poetic. 
It's um, what he did in the They series is he took families during the Cultural Revolution and then he went back and found them after the Cultural Revolution. And you can see how, what the Cultural Revolution did to their faces, the sadness. Um, and you also see that one is missing. But the artistry here is he's darkened that part of the photograph, sort of suggesting some loss, not just a photograph. There is real, and it's always shown um, um, as a diptych. The University of Chicago also has uh, one of this series. Wang Fen, um, another piece um, that, that is a particular favorite of my sister's because, again, we went to Catholic school for 12 years. She sees the uniform. Here, uh, the girl is sort of dressed in a more of a parochial fashion, looking at the new China with this sort of nondescript, it is contemporary modern architecture, but it's not that great. This is called the Over the Wall series. Oops. Zhang Dali we have in our collection. Um, Zhang Dali is sort of a graffiti, the, you know, the, the graffiti artist in, um, in China. But not just doing graffiti for graffiti's sake, but he is uh, protesting the, the, the pulling down of all the old historical buildings in Beijing to rush into the new century with everything modern. So he puts the tagline AK-47 as if we're like bulldozing down all of our old buildings. And the way you know it's Zhang Dali is it always has that profile of a human face. He is, many people would compare him to Keith Haring. These are subway drawings where Keith Haring did his, uh, his people next to um, uh, posters for movies and things, and people uh, collect these. This is the one that we have in our collection. And I, he, and I was saying at lunch earlier, I, I have to justify why I'm buying this one and not 30 of the other, because unlike Charles, I don't buy all 100 of them. I can afford to buy one. Um, so um, this one appealed to me as a doctor because the branches looked like the brain. It looked like the brain stem and the axons going out, um, the, the uh, cutout of the stone looked like the vertebrae to me. So of all the works I saw, I said, this is the one I must have. And finally, when I think about East and West, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Zhang Dali, this is how we have to keep bringing the Chinese and showing how the relationship, how it's similar to the West, but it's, it's different. And, it's, and it, the meaning is very different than what was done. So uh, if you don't believe me, uh, you, uh, this is uh, Art in America, Richard's pu publication. This is from December. That's showing the importance of, of Chinese, uh, Chinese contemporary photography specifically that despite today's social media image profusion, key Chinese photographers still value materiality, physical space, and the camera's link to a vanishing collective past. I just want to thank uh, the artists for their work, Art in America, the auction houses, and my whole team at the Jafour Family Collection. Thank you. We had, uh, we had scheduled a um, discussion time, but I was told that actually people probably going to prefer conversation uh, over coffee and cookies. Um, but I do want to just take one minute to ask some questions. Um, of course, we can continue our discussion. I know the audience also have a lot of questions for these wonderful um, three and four speakers here. Um, a specific question is for Richard, is that um, you really mentioned sort of the Chineseness and how challenging it is for our audience here who are not used to Chinese aesthetics to decode the works. But also I want to ask you, the question is that a lot of works we have seen were sort of mid-career artists born in the 60s, some late 50s, like Xu Bing and Cai Guochang, but really mainly we're looking at uh, artists uh, born in the 60s and 70s and maybe early 80s. Um, and these are the generation of people who went through a lot dramatic changes in China. But when you look at people, you know, Ba Ling Ho, post 
uh, 1980s, you know, they didn't know much about a cultural revolution, and they actually um, uh, educated in America and in Europe, and you don't see Chinese in their work. For example, some artists, they're just purely very abstract, and their work just visually, you don't see those, uh, what we traditionally labeled as Chinese or question for you is, you know, what's next? What's next? How, you know, who are those people, you know, you think that gonna uh, be able to actually speak to a broader audience, but also um, have something for us to label as Chinese artists? Um, the second question is for um, Charles and uh, Anthony, is that both of you are uh, collectors of sort of the global, of global scale, scale and global scope. Um, you are both collecting um, non-Chinese artists' work and Chinese artists' work. Um, so I want to ask you just from a collecting point of view, from a market point of view, how would you compare um, these works, non-Chinese and Chinese artists, photography um, and other kind of works in terms of quality? in terms of availability, in terms of price point. When you, of course, you, both of you are expert collectors, you really look at contents and significance, all kinds of things, but also I want a little more when you, you know, maybe some specific case studies when you're actually comparing um, artists from different cultures. Um, so that's my questions, and now it's time for cookies and coffees and tea. <laughs> Thank you.